here are the terms for this, uh, this lecture on the quandary of slavery. By the end of this presentation, you should understand first how the actions of the enslaved shaped a Union military policy. Second is Benjamin Butler's contraband order and its significance. Then Lincoln's confrontation with another general, John C. Fremont, over Fremont's Emancipation Order in August of 1861. Then Lincoln's journey to emancipation, by which I mean how he went from wanting to avoid um, attacking slavery to coming to the conclusion that uh, an emancipation policy was, uh, was necessary. Then I want you to understand what the Emancipation Proclamation did and did not do because many Americans are kind of confused on this point. And lastly, or next to lastly, the, the three main policies toward African-American slaves and freed people, and these, uh, these policies are free labor experiments, contraband camps, and contract labor, and I'll explain about, about how that all worked. And then finally, Sherman's Special Field Order 15 and its significance. The bottom line up front is that it's that that field order is the origin of the expression 40 acres and a mule, which we'll talk about in a bit. OK, by way of review, why did the uh, North not begin the war by attacking slavery? Why did the Lincoln administration avoid uh, attacking slavery at the outset? Well, one of the things that, uh, that Lincoln was quite sure of was that it would alienate the border states, Missouri, Kentucky and Maryland, and uh, uh, perhaps force them into the Confederacy. Next, it would alienate many Northerners, especially Democrats, who were on board with the war to restore the Union, perhaps, but you know, not at all on board with the idea of, make, of creating a war to, uh, uh, to liberate African-Americans. It would alienate Southern Unionists. It was, you know, Lincoln believed that there were a lot of, uh, uh, of Southerners living in, white Southerners living in uh, uh, what was now the Confederacy, who had not lost their basic allegiance to the United States. And if you didn't you know, push them away, by antagonizing them, um, you know, you might be able to get their get their support back. And then finally, any kind of destruction of, of slavery of the institution involves serious constitutional difficulties because the Constitution implicitly guaranteed the right to own slaves. Um, the word neither the word slave nor slavery appears anywhere in the Constitution, but you don't have to look very hard until you see that uh, um, that slavery is right in there. They just didn't, didn't call it as such. Okay. Military attitudes towards slavery at the outset, you know, again, we're, we're basically oriented toward let's 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 leave slavery alone and let's um, let's concentrate on defeating the Confederate government and its armies and so forth as as rapidly as we as we can do it. The problem with that attitude, or you know, was that. It ran up against the um, uh, African Americans themselves because the policy depended upon the neutrality of uh, of enslaved African Americans, and uh, which is to say, they would stay put and they weren't going to wouldn't do anything uh, with regard to um, taking advantage of the new situation with the war. But in fact, almost immediately, um, some African Americans uh, and slaves came into Union lines. It's called Fort Monroe, Virginia. It's near uh, uh, Norfolk, Virginia. And Fort Monroe was under the command of Major General Benjamin F. Butler, who had no military experience to speak of, but what had been a prominent Democratic politician and a lawyer, very capable lawyer. A few days after these uh, um, these enslaved African Americans came into uh, Union lines. A Confederate major, a guy named John Kerry, showed up and basically, you know, wanted to talk to General Butler. And what he said is, you know, hey, you know, we think we're an independent country now, but you guys say that we're still part of the United States. And if that's the case, then the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 is still in force. And so I'm coming to you, you know, for you to, you know, to return those slaves under your, you know, your law, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which you say applies, you know, because this is still, you know, you don't recognize it as part of the Confederacy. And this major John Kerry thought he was a pretty smart guy. Anyway, not nearly as smart as as uh, as Butler, because what Butler shot back is, "You think they're property? They're slaves and they're property. Okay, I'll I'll concede that they're slaves. They're your slaves and they are property. I'm not going to deal with them as being human beings. But here's the thing: you are making war 
upon the United States. And you are utilizing the labor of these particular enslaved African Americans, you know, to build fortifications for you, dig fortifications for you. Because that in fact was that was in fact what was going on. They had they had uh, escaped from um uh, from doing that kind of work, and that's how they got the union lines. So this this kind of this species of property falls under the, the heading of contraband of war. During wartime, I'm you know, under the laws of war. You can take supplies from an ad, from an advert from an enemy or prevent the, an enemy from uh, from getting these you're getting supplies as contraband of war. You know, there's just there's certain you know, just, you're not going to give the, you're not going to give your enemy you know resources, and it's well um, it's well established in the laws of war. And this is what I'm doing. I'm going to declare these these slaves contraband of war. And so Major John Kerry went away without the uh, without the slaves and a new um, a new word entered into the American lexicon for the uh, for the rest of the war. And that was contraband and, what, and contraband in this context was used as a noun noun and it referred to um, African-American slaves or freed people, it was kind of like whatever kind of ambiguous legal status um, they were in during the Civil War. Just contraband was the, the word that got used with them um, most often. Okay, so that was in May of 1861, and Butler sort of neatly solved uh, that problem without creating uh, trouble for the Lincoln administration. But uh, just three months later, Major General John C. Fremont, who incidentally had been the, uh, uh, the Republican candidate for president in 1856 and had been an army officer before that and was now back in uniform and in command of uh, the Department of Missouri, the state of Missouri. On August 30th, 1861, he issued an emancipation order. He placed Missouri under law, martial law by that order, and he declared that all property of those in active rebellion would be confiscated, including their slaves. Lincoln was horrified because he believed that Fremont's order might cause Kentucky to secede. Kentucky, by the way, had proclaimed itself neutral in the war. And so its loyalty to the Union was precariously. It was still in the Union, hadn't, succeed, hadn't seceded. It wasn't part of the Confederacy, but it was like, well, we're, we're neutral. We're, we're staying out of this. Um, it's kind of a preposterous idea in legal terms, but you know, politically, it was it was a potent argument and Lincoln respected it. So anyway, to avoid the loss of of Kentucky, among other things, Lincoln made Fremont rescind that order on September 11th, 1861. So he had actually, you know, taken a strong action against um, an incipient effort at emancipation. What Lincoln did in the in the in the early going was. He tried to persuade the border states, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, to end slavery, you know, using their power as states. Because un un unlike uh, federal action, which would, be, would have been constitution, states, you know, had a perfect right to, you know, to um, to rescind slave the uh, slave laws and so forth and emancipate slaves if, if they chose to do so. So that was uh, uh, Lincoln's policy in the early going. Um, it didn't work out as we're going to see, but as the, as the war, you know, moved into six months, seven months into the winter of 1862, the official Union policy remained that the Union Army was going to be, as the expression went, neither Negro stealers nor Negro catchers. But the practical issue to recapitulate is that the enslaved did not remain passive. And there's a this photograph here shows uh, African American uh, refugees. Fugitive slaves have gotten on um, uh, wagons and so forth, and they are um, trailing after a Union army uh, in Northern Virginia in uh, in August of 1862. So they're not remaining passive, and they're forcing the uh, the Union army then to adapt you know, on the basis of you know, the fact that, that you know they they are in the they're in the the practical position of either having to. Um, allow these these African Americans into their lines, in which case they are quote unquote Negro stealers, or returning them to their owners, in which case they're quote unquote Negro catchers. Um, 
but you know, either way, uh, African Americans are taking that uh, neutrality, you know, off the off the table because they themselves are not neutral. Now, General George B. McClellan um, was very much a proponent of being conciliatory toward the uh, toward the South as much as possible, respecting. Uh, the rights of Southern civilians, including their, their their right to property, including their right to have slaves. And as at the end of the Seven Days Battles in um, uh, June, July, 1862, um, McClellan began to get a sense that the Lincoln administration was starting to move away from uh, the conciliatory policy that McClellan himself endorsed and might be moving in the direction of emancipation. On July 7th, 1862, he sat down and wrote out a letter. It's called the Harrison's Landing Letter because at that time the Army of the Potomac was uh, uh, was at a new, new base camp at Harrison's Landing on the James River uh, south of Richmond. Virginia, this is where they had, uh, the army had retreated after the Seven Days Battles. Lincoln came down for a visit, uh, and McClellan handed him this letter, uh, the letter dated July 7th, became famous as the Harrison's Landing letter, um, and handed it, and, and, and Lincoln read it, and, and the, uh, the burden of it was, don't stop the conciliatory policy, it's going to make things worse, for God's sake, don't uh, issue any kind of emancipation policy because it will be so unpopular with with the, our soldiers who have enlisted to, to to fight for the Union, not to fight to free slaves. It will be so unpopular with them that they'll desert. He says that in so many in so many words. Lincoln reads the re, reads the letter, pockets it, and uh, doesn't get much play um, publicly. In fact, it, it it is not shared publicly until the 1864 presidential campaign. We'll get into that. Uh, in a bit. But Lincoln has reached the point where he no longer um, believes that a conciliatory policy is workable or that avoiding an attack on slavery um, is uh, is realistic. And he has his, his sort of journey to emancipation. And I'll just put this up here for you to, to look at sort of the main um, sort of milestones or, you know, or gateposts uh, in his uh, uh, in his journey from wanting to leave slavery alone in April 1861 to making a decision that he's going to issue an emancipation proclamation. He discusses this with his cabinet, July 22nd, 1862. And you can see that in between, there are a number of, uh, of things that occur that suggest uh, that, that Lincoln is trying to move toward emancipation um, within existing federal uh, law. To issue an emancipation proclamation is going to be unconstitutional unless he can do it under his powers um, as commander in chief, as a military necessity. And so on July 22nd, 1862, Lincoln meets with his cabinet um, and reads to them this preliminary emancipation proclamation. And what this preliminary emancipation proclamation says is, hey, I'm serving notice to you Confederates states or pretended um, states in the Confederacy, that if you don't come back into the Union uh, within 100 days, uh, I am going to issue a final emancipation proclamation uh, liberating all the slaves you know, within, um, within, the, within territories that are, that are still in rebellion. This uh, uh, painting that you're looking at was done by a a painter named uh, Francis B. Carpenter in 1864, spent six months at the White House and, uh, and uh, did paintings of all of, uh, of Lincoln and all of his cabinet members. And these, these uh, cabinet members, he placed in order of how, how comfortable uh, the cabinet members felt about this Emancipation Proclamation. And the person closest to, uh, to Lincoln, you know, behind him is Salmon, B., Salmon P. Chase, the Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, who was an, you know, pretty much an abolitionist and was very um, receptive to the idea of, of an emancipation policy. If you look um, to Lincoln's left, so toward the right of the image, look past uh, the bearded guy, that's uh, Gideon Wells, the Secretary of the Navy, 
the guy who's, who's sitting in profile with his uh, hands folded is Secretary of State William Seward. And Seward is a really smart politician. And in fact, he had a shot at being the, link, being the Republican nominee in 1860 and, and, uh, and through kind of a fluke, as far as he was concerned, Abraham Lincoln got the nomination instead. And he sort of, he's, he tended to think of himself as being more sophisticated and, um, and just having better political instincts than Lincoln did. It took him a long time to figure out who was wrong about that. But in any event, Seward suggested that to Lincoln that, hey, okay, I get it about the Emancipation Proclamation that you reached this decision and so forth, and I'm on board with it. But, you know, in the early spring, we were doing well. We had uh, had a, a series of victories. Um, we'd captured New Orleans. We'd captured Nashville. We had gotten control of much, much of Western and Middle Tennessee. We had, you know, gotten control over the border states. But lately, we've been losing. And we just now lost in a big, big way when McClellan's Peninsula campaign um, was defeated by Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. So if you issue an Emancipation Proclamation you know, in this particular moment, it is not going to come across as a gesture of strength. It is going to come across as weakness. It will come across like the last streak in the retreat. Oh my gosh, we've lost. We we lost so much that all we the only thing we can think of to do is like you know free the slaves so they can start some kind of slave insurrection and so forth. That's all we got going for us. That was that was the burden of what Seward was trying to uh, to say, and he did it in a more dignified way than I've just done. But that's the basic point. Lincoln thought what Seward was saying made a lot of sense, and so for the time being, Lincoln pocketed away that Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, and awaited a Union victory that would allow him to issue that Emancipation Proclamation from a position of strength. On September 17th, 1862, was fought the Battle of Antietam. Still remains the bloodiest single day in American military history. To be perfectly frank, it was a Union victory only by extension of the of the word. It was, it was basically the battle was a tactical stalemate, but the result was that Lee's army, which had invaded Maryland, went back into Virginia, and that made it look enough like a victory that Lincoln felt like, okay, this this gives me uh, an opportunity to issue that preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, which he did five days after the battle, uh, September twenty second, eighteen sixty two. Um, again, gave gave uh, the Southern states hundred days to come back into uh, into the Union. He knew perfectly well that, that they weren't going to do that. And so on July, on January 1st, 1863, he signed the final Emancipation Proclamation. And there's some key points you need to know about it. First, he, side, he sidestepped this constitutional problem by framing the proclamation as a military necessity and therefore constitutional because as president, he was commander in chief. The proclamation, therefore, applied only in regions that were still in active rebellion. And if you read the proclamation, you'll see that it omits numerous counties in the seceded states that were already occupied by Union forces, because the idea is if we already control those counties, the rebellion is no longer is not enforced there. There's no point in uh, implementing emancipation as a military necessity because it's not militarily necessity necessary in those particular counties. And it omitted the entire states of Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland and Delaware all slave states, and then for political reasons, the entire state, slave state of Tennessee, even though Tennessee was part of the Confederacy. And it therefore left at least 800,000 Americans, African Americans, still enslaved. So this is even after the issuance of this Emancipation Proclamation. And, and as a practical matter, you know, all of the um, uh, Slaves were still enslaved because the, the Emancipation Proclamation, what was in, you know, once it was issued, was could take took effect only in areas where the Union Army did not did not occupy. And so, until the, the Union armies occupied that territory and got control over it, you know, no slaves, as a practical matter, were going to be liberated. Well, 
In the meantime, though, you had thousands, tens of thousands by this time, um, fugitive slaves or people who were, um, you know, free on, through operation of the Emancipation Proclamation as Union armies moved into areas that, 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 had, that were still in active rebellion and so on. So you had the, these, these, these people called the contrabands. And so the question is, what were you going to do uh, with these people during the, uh, um, you know, during the war? And it fell to the U.S. Army more than any other federal entity to sort this thing out, because as a practical matter, it was it was a serious military problem. You know, we have we have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, ultimately, of these civilians um, that, in essence, are going to are getting in the way of our military effort to defeat the Confederate armies. So, you know, we need to we need to get them in some kind of stable situation so that we can conduct military operations without them, you know, crowding the roads and and trying to get work and trying to get food and basically creating an unstable um situation. So there are three solutions that the, the army came up with. The first, and this was in conjunction with civilian authorities like the, the, the Treasury Department, there were a limited number of what were called free labor experiments. One of these was uh, in the, uh, the islands immediately off the coast of South Carolina. This is down south of uh, Charleston, where Hilton Head is nowadays and so on. And this uh, this area had been taken over um, by the U.S. Navy in uh, late 1861, uh, so that those islands could be used as uh, coaling stations for uh, warships that were off you know, off the coast doing blockade duty. All the local planters fled, leaving their slaves behind, and so what was done with you know with the slaves that were left behind was that they were put to work. Uh, and they were put to work under conditions where they themselves, you know, were able to organize their labor and decide what they were going to do uh, and sort of, you know, able to handle things pretty much on their own. A lot of uh, missionaries came down from the north and teachers um, and humanitarians of various kinds to come down and help these people uh, in the Sea Islands and to provide them with education and to provide them with religious instruction and to provide them with material assistance. Uh, and so forth. So that's one major free labor experiment that went on. The other big one was um, a place called Davis Bend in Mississippi. And it was named for a bend in the Mississippi River where there were two plantations, one owned by Jefferson Davis. Yes, that Jefferson Davis, President Jefferson Davis. Um, and the other one owned by his brother, Joseph Davis, who was actually a Confederate um, general. Uh, this is a photograph taken in 1865 of freed people on that uh, plantation of Joseph Davis. And during, uh, during the war, they too had an opportunity to um, take control of the, the lands that Davis and Jefferson Davis and his, uh, his brother had controlled. And they, they planted their own, their own crops and cultivated them and harvested them and so forth. And they uh, practiced a self um, a degree of self-rule and so forth. So there's the second experiment with um, with free labor, and these were really these were really significant um, experiments at one level, level, but they were only done on a small scale. On a much larger scale was something called contraband camps, and these were honestly these were concentration camps, you know, where free pre where free people were brought into um, encampments. Where they were, they were obliged to stay, and they worked, and they worked under um, Union military supervision directly. And some of these contraband camps were more or less okay, and some of them were just overcrowded and filled with disease and very, very problematic. Um, but there were a lot of them. If you look at this map here, um, if you look at those uh, those little pyramids, what you're looking at are each one is a contraband camp, and you can see that there's quite a few of them in Virginia and along along the coast, and a lot in the Mississippi River uh, Valley. And there were tens of thousands of uh, contrabands, so-called, uh, in those particular camps. And again, some of them, you know, were 
okay. Some of them were pretty horrible. One of the ones that was okay was um, uh, just outside of Corinth, Mississippi. That's in the, the very northern part of uh, uh, Mississippi, in the northeastern eastern corner. Uh, and this Corinth, this contraband camp at Corinth, um, was a marvel because it produced cotton for the Department of the Treasury and actually turned a profit uh, for the for the Department of the Treasury and the the freed people uh, there, they constructed a school for their children. They constructed a church where they could worship. They constructed barns. They constructed stables, um, you know, rail fences, all sorts of things. And they made a decent life for themselves. And in recent years, this this uh, part of this the site of this contraband camp has been made into uh, into a park, and that's what you're looking at here. And there's a kind of a touching um, statue of a mother and daughter reading together at this, at this Corinth contraband camp. Um, and it would be nice to tell you that everything worked out well for the people who lived in the Corinth contraband camp. And things should have worked out well for them because um, a considerable number of the African-American men who were at that contraband camp uh, joined um, a, uh, a Union infantry regiment uh, and went off to fight uh, for, for the Union. But the problem from the standpoint of Major General William T. Sherman, when he was beginning getting ready to do his operations uh, in the spring of 1864, was that he didn't need to control Corinth, Mississippi anymore, and therefore there was no, he was not going to be in a position to protect the free people at the Corinth contraband camp. So what he did was he put them all on uh, trains and sent them 60 miles west uh, to Memphis, Tennessee, where there were several contraband camps, all of them terribly overcrowded, all of them unsanitary, all of them filled with disease. Uh, and these same people who, these people who had done such a, such a decent job of creating a new life for themselves, it all just fell to pieces because, you know, the Union Army, first and foremost, was out to win the war. It was not conducting some kind of, you know, social experiments and trying to make life better. for people. Who were, it was interested in winning the war. And so, you know, as long as the, the Corinth contraband camp functioned to create, you know, to create a stable situation for military operations by getting free people out of the way, fine. Once it, once it served its purpose, it was gone. The, th the third and most common way that the contrabands were handled was, was through a system of contract labor. And the way that this operated was Union, this was done in the Mississippi River Valley, and the guy behind it uh, mostly was a general named Nathaniel P. Banks, who, like Ben Butler, was a politician, uh, not a professional general. And what Banks came up with in Louisiana and then subsequently in, in Mississippi was a system that basically said, hey, look, you know, the, the, go on, the officers would go into a plantation and they would say, slavery no longer exists on this plantation. And and then the you know, and the free people would be like, oh great, slavery no longer exists. I can, you know, we can go out and and go on the roads and look for our, our relatives and you know find a new life for ourselves someplace else. And these union officers are like, no, not so fast. You're not going anywhere. You are going to stay here on this plantation because you are now employees of your former owner, who is now your employer. And you, former owner, what you are going to do is either pay your new employees some money or you're going to pay them a share of the crop. And, you know, we decree that a contract now exists between you that. You know, the employees will labor for you faithfully for a year and then we'll, we'll see about the contract the next time and you will take care of them and you, will, you know, you'll follow certain rules and this kind of a thing, you know, and you're stuck with this. And if there's any problems or whatever, come to us and we'll sort them out. And usually when there were problems, the, the, the union officers would sort them out in favor of the former um, owner. But about half a million um, African-Americans, you know, nominally freed through operation of the Emancipation Proclamation, actually spent 
um, the rest of the war essentially as enslaved persons, you know, free in name only because of this contract labor system. The last point to be made has to do with the uh, with this special field order number 15 issued in January 1865 by uh, General William T. Sherman. Now, at this particular point, Sherman has captured Atlanta. He's conducted a march, uh, a march from Atlanta to Savannah, Georgia, the famous march to the sea, and he's getting ready to march northward, northward through the Carolinas, South Carolina, North North Carolina, on his way to link up with Grant's army in the Richmond Petersburg area. And what Sherman has encountered during the march to the sea was lots and lots, thousands of African Americans following uh, his army and getting in the way. Um, there was one instance where they were getting in the way to the point where uh, a, the Union Army crossed a, um, a creek through pon over, over pontoon bridges, a rain swollen creek, pontoon bridges, and then took up the pontoons before African American refugees following the army could get across. Confederate cavalry came along, killed a lot of those uh, African American refugees. You know, So the point that I'm making here is that when Sherman issues this thing I want to tell you about now, the, field, the Special Field Order 15, he's not doing it as a great humanitarian. He's interested in solving a problem, does not want any freed people following his army as it marches north into the Carolinas. Militarily, that's just not you know, a good idea. So what he does instead is there, there's a lot of abandoned land um, in, on the, in the coast of Georgia and South Carolina. And you can see uh, that band of land um, uh, you know, in, in the map. What Sherman did was he set aside uh, that land that was abandoned and basically said, look, this, um, every African-American family um, can have 40 acres of that abandoned land. And if we have surplus horses and mules and implements and so forth, they can have those as well. And this is where the expression 40 acres and a mule comes from. And so through operation of Special Field Order 15, um, Hundreds of African American families acquired land that was legally theirs through operation of Special Field Order 15, and they lived, um, uh, you know, independently and in, in, until 1867, when President Andrew Johnson abruptly rescinded the order and kicked them off that land so that the former or for the former owners could come back and take over that uh, that property again. The major takeaway from this lecture on the quandary of slavery is for you to understand that this that this moment of emancipation is not kind of like a wonderful, joyous, celebratory uh, event. It was it was tremendously bittersweet. And the second thing to, to understand as part of it is that the, the Union Army wanted to stay away from slavery as much as it could. And once it got involved with dealing with slavery, looked at it very much from the standpoint of how do we deal with this destroyed institution of slavery and the people that it's left behind in such a way as to enable us to conduct military operations efficiently. And mostly the policies required to conduct military operations efficiently involved giving these newly freed human beings the shaft.